happy to uh, i mean is there any discussion at the end yes when we finish uh, i will ask if anyone has questions and then we start okay perfect so okay. let me say let me know whenever you want i will start. yeah i think we can start now so thank you everyone for joining us today today we have dr anna fagotti from rome in italy she will be talking about hypic innovating cancer Thank you, Dr. Anna, for joining us and accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to um, discuss with you uh, such uh, an active community in Egypt, I must say. And um, this is a very uh, nice topic for me, and especially this is so uh, important right now because we have we are having more and more information and more and more studies that have been presented and published in the last year. So I think it I think it deserves some. Uh, uh, comments that I'm like I'm happy to discuss with you. Um, so first of all, general principles probably you all know, but just to remember why we are talking about IPEC in ovarian cancer. And as we all know, more than 70% of ovarian cancer patients have a peritoneal spread with high rate of recurrence and short survival. But we all believe that surgery is a very important part of the treatment of advanced ovarian cancer. So we still believe that advanced ovarian cancer is mainly a local regional disease, which diffuses within the abdomen. And so this is why we still believe that cytoreductive surgery is important as local regional treatment. And therefore, there is no reason uh, not to support the use of intraperitoneal chemotherapy as a, an, um, a, an effective local regional treatment as well. Um, so we use uh, cytoreductive surgery up to no gross residual disease to treat peritoneal metastasis because these are, this is still a regional disease. So uh, IPEC is also a local regional treatment where we combine the effect of cytoreductive surgery together with the effect of intraperitoneal chemotherapy and the effect of hyperthermia. I will not focus on I intraperitoneal chemotherapy itself. I think you all know the studies, so I would like to discuss specifically on IPEC. And you all know that the reason that we are uh, performing anyway, or we are giving intraperitoneal chemotherapy within the peritoneal cavity is that, of course, we can reach a higher concentration of drug by direct exposure of the tumor to the drug itself. But we also have uh, like, um, uh, um, like a uh, barrier which is the peritoneal plasma barrier, which on one side can keep the drug within the peritoneal cavity, but on the other side can bring some of the drug into the blood vessels and so in the um, uh, systemic uh, circulation. So on one side, we have a higher concentration to the tumor, but on the other side, we also have some drug going into the blood vessels and going systemically with a lower, lower concentration for sure, but also with lower uh, systemic toxicity. Indeed, I must say, and I can anticipate to you that we we perform IPEC for ovarian cancer patients, and I have never seen some um, systemic uh, cytotoxicity uh, related to the drug. So, like uh, you know, anemia or thrombocytopenia or le leukopenia related to the uh, uptake of the drug in the blood. Um, another important information that we must have is that the, the regional delivery of chemotherapy penetrates up to five to eight millimeters. And this is important because if you don't know this, we don't, you, we, we, cannot understand uh, some um, uh, specific, uh, let's say, um, inclusion criteria of the trial regarding um, patient's characteristics. So, if we consider surgery and IPEC, again, we have three times we can consider surgery with, uh, let's say, um, a curative intent, which is primary interval and recurrence. I would not talk about palliative setting, although we have some data regarding the PPAC in the palliative setting. 
um, which is another way to deliver uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy in like in an aerosol um, way. Um, but again, you see here, the, the CRS score is also important, which means uh, residual disease. And as you can see here, uh, it also means completeness of cytoreduction after surgery. And we always apply IPAC in patients with R0 or R1 disease, uh, residual disease, which means up to 2.5 millimeters. And now you can easily understand why this is an inclusion criteria, because if we use uh, this uh, approach in patients with R2, we know that it could not be effective just because it doesn't penetrate into the tumor just because it's in contact with it. Um, and we also combine the effect of hyperthermia. So um, I think this is important because with the time we are knowing more and more about the effect of hyperthermia and especially the effect of hyperthermia combined with new um, chemotherapy uh, drugs or even with targeted treatment. You look at this. So IPEC, which means that the effect of hyperthermia can increase apoptosis, can uh, uh, release it shock proteins, inhibits DNA repair. And this is important, for example, for um, with respect to HRD patients, and we will see it later. It enhances cytokine release. It enhances or favor favors antigen presentation. And so it might be also important if related with some kind of immunotherapy. It increases T cells activation, increases blood flow, and promotes perfusion. So if combined with other kind, even of systemic chemotherapy, we can increase the, uh, the flow and um, the, the, the concentration of the drug in the tumor. So the rationale uh, at the end, um, IPEC targets peritoneal disease for sure, which is a key point for ovarian cancer. There are no barriers of postoperative addition. So if we do it at the, at the end of cytoreductive surgery, we are sure that the diffusion of the drug within the peritoneal cavity will be as much uh, complete as possible. There is no interval between uh, cytoreductive surgery and chemotherapy because this is done intraoperatively. So if we are worried about the risk of delaying chemotherapy, systemic chemotherapy after big surgery with um, high risk of long postoperative, uh, let's say, course, then we can use this kind of approach. We can reach higher concentration at the disease site. We can limit the systemic toxicity. And we can enhance the effect of chemotherapeutic agents by increasing tumor penetration through different mechanisms and DNA cross-linking. So as you can see, the rationale is really strong, at least in my opinion, but we have had until January 2018, many, many problems um, in order to make this approach really uh, considered by uh, the community. Um, the main problems have been that we have many studies have not been performed in gynecologic oncology centers um, and mainly came from retrospective data on very heterogeneous population of platinum sensitive and platinum resistant disease. There was a poor quality of the data because uh, people use different drugs, different temperature, different techniques like open or um, closed techniques. Uh, there was um, a high toxicity or it was poorly reported, but we still had some interesting data of a potential potential activity, mainly from case control studies. So um, although we had many limitations, we still had the feeling that this could be effective in some, um, with some indication and in a specific population. So this is um, um, a slide which I took from uh, Oliver Zivanovic from the MSK, which are misconceptions and strong beliefs uh, in the community about IPEC. So sometimes people say IPEC sounds fancy. This is all. Patients are often, often associate IPEC with the concept of high tech, but it's not. I mean, it's really simple and I will show you. 
uh, they believe that this is cutting edge technology in the OR, and it's not. Surgeon and hospitals sell IPEC for ovarian cancer as a cure, and it's not. So we must be very honest when we discuss with the patient about the possibilities and the results of IPEC. Some experts recommend using of IPEC in the primary and recurrent setting, whereas others uh, do not suggest to perform IPEC in any setting. So probably, as always, uh, we should look for the right indication in the right patient. So this was the introduction. And now, you know, as I told you, we have some very interesting randomized control trials and some recent prospective studies. Uh, in the interest of time, I will discuss with you only the results of the recent randomized control trials. And this is a very nice um, uh, slide, which I took from my colleague from Tarkey, which really um, uh, summarizes all the studies, mainly randomized in the last years. And and each of them, each color has a different meaning, and I will explain to you. So if we look at the green color, we have positive studies in this respective setting, as you can see here. And of course, these slides has been um, implemented and updated with the new studies. Then we have uh, the red color, which means negative studies, like, for example, the current study, which is half positive and half the negative according to the setting of the patient that we are um, studying. Then we have these two trials in, in white, which are really prospective studies. They are not randomized, and therefore I will not discuss with you. Um, and we have two older studies, like the Spiliotis study and the um, uh, Cascale study, which actually are more or less recent, but they are not conclusive very well, uh, not really conclusive. So I will just give some mention, but will not enter into the details. And I will give you immediately um, some information. The Spiliotis study was very much criticized because of the um, lack of the statistical background and statistical analysis. So there was a, a very mixed population and it was not clear in terms of statistics statistical analysis, so we cannot really um, uh, make take conclusion from this study. And this Antonio Cascale study was actually stopped prematurely because this has exactly the same design as the Avipec-1 trial, and they thought that this was not um, uh, ethical to continue the same study and randomizing patients to an arm which was without IPEC having a, the results of the IPEC one. So they made an analysis on a very small population, um, which was actually super impossible in terms of result to the IPEC one trial, but they couldn't take any conclusion because of the number of the, uh, the, uh, the sample size, so which was uh, limited from the premature uh, closure of the study. So we will discuss, first of all, of the OPIPEC-1 trial. We will know everything, but I will try to go fast and give you the last updates of the trial. This is the design, so only stage 3 disease. This is important because this was one reason of uh, mm, comments uh, and discussion why limiting of, um, IPEC only to stage 3 disease if we have stage 4 cases that can be resected or might respond to natural chemotherapy. And we actually have some data from our institution showing that the results from stage 4 responding to adjuvant chemotherapy are really very good and super impossible to the results from the OVPEC-1 trial. But this was the study as it was designed. And you must remember that this was designed many years ago and they wanted to be consistent. They would have received um, um, comments, uh, um, negative comments anyway. Whatever they did, they would have received comments um, and so this is what it is. These patients were considered unresectable according to multidisciplinary tumor board, and they received natural chemotherapy three to four cycles. And at least patients who had stable disease after three cycles, uh, they underwent 
second um, interval de Balkin surgery with or without um, IPEC. IPEC was performed with cisplatin 100 milligrams per meter square associated with sodium thiosulfate. And this is important as well because the dose of cisplatin is much higher than the doses that have been reported from other studies on, um, on IPEC, which was uh, usually 50 milligrams or 75 milligrams per meter square. And also the association with sodium thiosulfate for nephroprotection is very important because um, they found they had no uh, toxicity, kidney toxicity, renal failure, which was uh, one of the most common complications related to, uh, to IPEC. And all patients received then additional three cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. You see here that no PARP inhibitors and no bevacizumab were allowed in this study as adjuvant treatment. So again, this is a short summary of uh, patient's characteristics. We discussed it, all, the, all the characteristics except for performance status, adequate renal and bone marrow function. You see here that the surgery uh, residual disease had to be less than one centimeter and no history of previous malignancy within five years prior uh, to inclusion. Um, this is, uh, again, um, a summary of the administration of IPEC. Um, this was an open technique. I told you the dose of cisplatinum, which was divided during the time of perfusion that you see was overall 90 minutes. It was 50% of the entire dose at the beginning, and then after 30 minutes, 25%, and after 60 minutes, additionally 25%. And this is the temperature, this is the, uh, the flow of the infusion, and sodium sulfate was uh, given. And these are the results. So you all know these results. So we have for recurrence-free survival and overall survival, a clear advantage of um, uh, the addition of IPEC to surgery with respect to no IPEC. This is the difference in terms of months. And you also, um, there were many uh, discussion about these results and I will tell you later. I just want to show you that, of course, the two populations were balanced in terms of clinical characteristics and in terms of postoperative adverse events, as you can see here, all except one, which was the rate of ileostomy or colostomy among patients who had bowel resection, which was much higher in the group of, um, uh, of patients having IPEC with respect to no IPEC. Um, this was uh, one of the main criticism. Um, and we will discuss also this finding later. So the main results of the OVIPEC one were that the addition of IPEC to interval de Balkin surgery leads to an improvement in both progression-free survival and overall survival, that there was a no delay in terms of starting adjuvant chemotherapy in the group of IPEC with respect to no IPEC, that the number of patients completing six cycles of chemotherapy were similar, that the number of patients uh, receiving treatment for the current disease were comparable and toxicity was not increased by IPEC administration. So there were still two points missing at that time, at the time of the discussion, which were the long-term survival data and the details on treatment for recurrent disease. And I'm showing you this slide because these results have been presented at ASCO this year. And these are the results. So after 10 years of follow-up, remember that the results were presented with a median follow-up time of around six years. So they had the, uh, the necessary number of events for the statistical analysis. After 10 years, they are presenting the final results where you see the ADSO ratio for recurrence-free survival and for I will show you later, overall survival is really super impossible and the difference is still the same. So as you can see here, four months in favor of IPEC for uh, recurrence-free survival 
and 11 months in terms of overall survival in favor of IPEC. Now, my comment in this regard is how many times uh, we have seen these results with respect to such many um, adjuvant treatment or any kind of chemotherapy. I would not speak about some of the target treatments um, with these excellent results and such low expenses. And the other point that um, was missing is the type of treatment of recurrence because this might affect the results in terms of survival. But as you can see here, there is no important difference in the two arms, IPEC and no IPEC with respect to all type of treatments at second line at time of recurrence. So um, all these patients had a limited use of Bevan PARP, even at second line. If you go, we go back and we look at the rate of PARP and Bev, you see it's really very low, even at second line. Lung survival benefit in high-grade tumors. Um, the timing of randomization, which was uh, approximately 14 weeks after diagnosis, should be taken into account when comparing uh, median recurrence-free survival and overall survival with other studies. Uh, and the similar hazard ratio for recurrence-free survival and overall survival indicate that uh, recurrence-free survival was a good surrogate endpoint for overall survival. Um, so based on the results uh, of 2018, actually NCCN have already included IPEC in, in their guidelines. And actually, I will show you later, there was a publication, I think in the 2022, where they showed how much increased the use of IPEC in the United States after the publication of the Van Driel trial. So major criticism, many, many criticism, and indeed still today we are, we are not mm, convinced or we do not agree as scientific community in Europe that IPEC should or could be considered like an option in patients with uh, interval debulking surgery. So the, this was the discussion and I will show you the reasons. So uh, regarding primary endpoint, progression-free survival instead of overall survival. If you remember well, at that time when the study was designed, the GCIG consensus meeting for ovarian cancer actually considered that PFS could be a good surrogate of overall survival, overall survival for clinical studies in ovarian cancer. And this is the reason is that this is the, the first event that we have after, after a treatment, whereas with the uh, number of lines, uh, overall survival could be delayed, de de um, delayed too much. And actually, with the results of the 10 years um, uh, study, you see that the hazard ratio is really consistent. The sample size class, uh, calculation was really small. Um, and this was uh, uh, considered the like a limitation. I think we had overall around 300 patients, 150 for each arm. And the recruitment was really long with the risk of hyperselection. And in some, pa in some cases, we had uh, centers that enrolled only few patients and centers that enrolled many patients. And if they made um, like a sub-analysis with stratification per center, they found that IPEC was not effective in those centers that were enrolling much more patients than in, in, in the other centers. The timing of randomization was performed before completion of surgery. This is a, a topic that has been discussed also for the OVPEC2 trial uh, because it might influence the surgeon. So the surgeons might, might consider to perform a more aggressive surgery if the patient is, uh, uh, is randomized in the IPEC arm than in the non-IPEC arm. Actually, this is um, really very complicated to think about this, but today for the OVIPEC2 trial, we must perform randomization at the end of surgery, not before the end. 
selection of patients, not defined criteria criteria for natural chemotherapy. Selection of centers was based mainly on the IPEC equipment instead of, um, let's say, surgical skills. Different histology, they were more unfavorable in the surgery group only instead of surgery plus IPEC. Complication rate was really was still too high, although not significant between the arms. And as I told you, the number of ostomies was unacceptably high. So for all these reasons, actually, uh, this study was really criticized, especially from uh, in Europe. So regarding the imbalance with uh, um, histological types, you see that actually is not really an imbalance because if we look at different randomized trials, we see that again, some of the, um, let's say more unfavorable histotypes are more represented in the group that is uh, um, the control arm instead of the experimental arm. So the same criticism, which was moved to the OVIPEC-1 trial is actually the same criticism that we, we can find also in other randomized trials, like for example, the desktop tree study. Also regarding uh, um, the, um, the, the, the distribution of PARP inhibitors and bevacizumab in the two trials, which was another uh, reason of criticism because they told you, they told that uh, it, they, they did not take into consideration the advances in terms of medical treatment for ovarian cancer patients. Actually, if we look at the percentages of patients who received PARP as part of second line treatment, only 94 patients, which were 47 in each group of the desktop trial, received BEV and only four to 6% of the patients received PARP inhibitors. So again, sometimes when we design the surgical trials, it takes time, you know, and they are not always aligned with the incredible results that we obtain with medical treatment. Um, again, toxicity, incredibly high. So this was presented at, uh, in JCO as one of the reasons for discussion and not using uh, IPEC. And actually, although this is not, I mean, this is not fair, this kind of comparison, this is what it was presented. So, so although statistically not significant, they told that IPEC increased the risk of infection of 63%, illus, 166%, pain, 44%, and so on. And actually, they also argued the fact that there was no alopecia at all, but the reason is that most of these patients which who were treated in the Netherlands actually received adjuvant treatment as intraperitoneal approach. And this was why um, these patients had few alopecia with respect to what reported outside. Um, so having said that, if we look at results for any other, um, let's say treatment, experimental treatment, and if we would should um, make the same comparison, look at this, how much is the difference? Although we say that there is no statistically significant event and with respect to an advantage, which is much lesser than IPEC and with higher costs, look at the difference in terms of, um, uh, let's say, peri, um, toxicity. Um, and of course, this is not a comparison that can be accepted. But we also made our own, our own um, evaluation. Indeed, after the publication of the trial in our institution, we have adopted the use of IPEC in patients who receive natural and chemotherapy, even with larger inclusion criteria with respect to the trial. And we tried to compare um, inter and post-operative complications in the two groups, IPEC versus non-IPEC, and actually 
non-IPEC is the group of patients who enter into other clinical trials. And you see here, there is no statistically significant difference. But if we look at the risk of bowel resection with stoma, in our population like this, you see that not only the rate is much lower than expected uh, with respect to the um, Van Riel trial, but the rate of, uh, um, of stomas, which is calculated in the group of patients receiving, only, only in the group of patients receiving bowel surgery is much lower in the hyper group with respect in the, to the non-hyper group. So it means that the difference is made by the type of surgery and the extension, extension of surgery is not based on the performance of IPEC or not. This was a discussion about uh, um, molecular characteristics of the patients. This was another criticism because patients were not described according to molecular characteristics, but I haven't seen any um, surgical studies showing these characteristics, including the LION trial or the desktop trial. But just to say that this group of patients who are named here like BRCA1 like, BRCA wild type, which in other words means HR deficient, is the group that in terms of recurrence-free survival has the greatest benefit using IPEC. This data was not confirmed at the primary analysis for overall survival, but I will show you here. This is the subgroup analysis presented this year at ASCO for overall survival. So with uh, an update uh, um, of this exactly the same, you see that this result is also confirmed in, uh, for the overall survival. So these patients who are the HR deficient seem the most, the ones that mainly uh, benefit from uh, IPEC. And if I go back a second, uh, this is an explanation on why and how the HRD patients, BRCA wild type, uh, um, may benefit uh, uh, from IPEC. And it seems that they have an in, um, impaired or intermediate BRCA1-2 protein function, function uh, which is degraded. Uh, um, the activity is reduced by IPEC, as you can see here, and sensitizes hyperthermic hyperthermia sensitizes cells DNA damage caused by platinum-based chemotherapy and PARP inhibitors. So, this is our study. We had no data about HRD, but actually, what we found is that if we compare patients. Uh, who had no IPEC BRCA wild type versus um, no IPEC BRCA mutated, you see that the BRCA wild type have the worst prognosis as expected. But if BRCA wild type patients receive IPEC, then there is no more statistically significant difference with respect to BRCA mutated patients. So it seems that IPEC is able to uh, increase the rates of progression-free and overall survival of BRCA wild type patients. And maybe among them, there is a subgroup of patients who are HRD that can benefit from IPEC and are able to increase the curve. So there are some data showing that there is a learning curve in order to reduce the risk of perioperative complications with IPEC. And this number is between 130 and 220, as shown here. I must also admit that very recently, I uh, revised the paper on um, the, um, let's say, the uh, complications rate in the last 10 years reported from IPEC and there is no difference. So although there are some data showing there is a learning curve, indeed, at the end of the story, and we don't know why this is in the same group of surgeons or maybe new surgeons have um, used IPEC, but the rate of perioperative complications has remained the same in the last 10 years. Is this cost effective? Yes, absolutely yes. If you look, um, although we consider um, the surgery cost, 
the days in the hospital, remember that in the OVIPEC-1 trial, the hospitalization time was a little bit longer with respect to, um, to no IPEC, as well as the uh, time in the operating room, which is longer because of the of the treatment, the ICU admission, which is um, in some cases uh, very frequent with IPEC, the use of the drug and so on, you see this is the overall cost, which is much lower with respect to one year of PEP and one year of PARP inhibitors. Quality of life, no difference, as you can see here with different items analyzed. And um, one of the other um, criticisms which was made to the OVIPEC-1 trial was that it's strange that we have such a large improvement or important improvement in terms of overall survival, whereas the difference in terms of recurrence-free survival is uh, much lower. And one of the, um, the explanation was that actually, if we look at the distribution of the type of recurrence, see, you see that in the surgery plus IPEC, uh, the rate of recurrence was lower in the peritoneum and was higher as extra abdominal recurrence. So it means, or no recurrence at all. So it means that probably the pattern of recurrence is different. And as we all know, the main reason for that is the peritoneal recurrence, which bring to bowel occlusion and then death. So whereas we can survive and we can prolong survival and try to cro chronicize the disease, uh, if this is extra abdominal in, in the lung or for example, in the lymph nodes. Another criticism was the fact that the length of survival in control arm was much lower, the worst ever with respect to other trials. Um, but we must also compare this population with um, some randomized trials that have been published up to now that reported the same uh, progression-free and overall survival as the Dutch trial, the Avipec-1 trial. In other words, of course, in the other, in the other trials, uh, we, um, we have a very heterogeneous population, including patients resected or optimally resected and patients receiving natural chemotherapy. Whereas this is a worse population where all patients were deemed unresectable. And if we compare this population with similar population, then it seems there is uh, no difference. So this is what we know and everybody knows about the um, OVIPEC-1 trial. We still have 10 minutes, let's say, or 15 minutes to go through the others. Uh, the current study, the current study was published in 2020. And this was a study, we, uh, you can see the design here, where 274 patients were enrolled. But the main difference with respect to the OVIPEC trial is that all ovarian cancer patients were included. So both patients receiving primary debulking surgery and patients receiving natural chemotherapy. So this was a, a very heterogeneous population. You see that patients were treated with 75 milligrams per meter square with cisplatinum for 90 minutes with the closet techniques. They included both stage three and four. The randomization was performed at the end of cytoreductive surgery. Uh, if the patient received an optimal site reduction, so up to less than one centimeter. If we look at the results and we take all the whole population together, you see there is no difference. So the main conclusion of this trial was that IPEC is not effective in patients with advanced ovarian cancer. But if we look at the subanalysis population, and this is a subanalysis population for patients receiving primary debulking surgery, again, no difference in terms of progression free and overall survival. But if we look at the population, the same population of the OVIPEC-1 trial, so patients considered unresectable and receiving Najvan chemotherapy, then here we find the difference. We find the difference in terms of progression-free and overall survival, the difference in terms of prog median 
progression free and overall survival is two months. So very short, exactly. It was four months in the AVIPEC uh, one, if I remember well. Whereas in terms of overall survival, a big difference of more than one year. So again, a difference between progression free and overall survival. And if you look at this, indeed, we have half of the study, which is red, primary cytoreduction and half of the study, which is green at time of interval cytoreduction after natural chemotherapy. Of course, we cannot take the same conclusion as the AVIPEC one because the study population was smaller if we made the subgroup analysis. So this study had not the power to define a difference between primary surgery and interval debulking surgery. But I want to show you the results of the CHIPOR trial. The CHIPOR trial is a French trial that has been presented this year at ASCO. You probably know very well it, but I'm very excited from these results. This was a, a randomized trial, phase three, which was performed in patients with platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer. Um, this was um, uh, done in the Gineco group in France and I don't want to enter into the details of the background because now we know everything about that. I want to show you the, um, the study design because I put this study in the platinum sensitive recurrence, uh, but the main, uh, the most important characteristics in my opinion is that all these patients at time of recurrence received chemotherapy before surgery. So it's like an adjuvant chemotherapy in a different setting of patients. And they received six cycles of platinum-based chemotherapy. They had a response at time of recurrence, and then they were deemed um, resectable uh, at time of surgery. So like an interval at time of recurrence. And if patients received the CC0 or CC1, so up to 2.5 millimeters, they were randomized to IPEC with cisplatin 75 milligrams for 60 minutes versus no IPEC. And then the standard of care maintenance treatment, as you can see here, there was also a stratification per center, residual disease, palatinum free interval, and planet PARP inhibitors. So primary endpoint, overall survival. They needed 268 events in order to perform the analysis. And this was done exactly at this number. Secondary endpoints, progression-free survival, time to subsequent treatment, and so on. Data cutoff analysis, January 2023, 20, 268 events observed, median follow-up 6.2 years. What they found, you see here the differences in terms of population. Um, the median platinum free interval was 17 months. 35% uh, had received BEV in the first line setting. This was the median age. Surgery to CC0 was 87%. And most of the patients completed the six cycles of chemotherapy. The, this is the median duration of surgery, or, or of course, longer in the HIPAC group. Around 40% of the patients received bowel resection. The stoma diversion was much lower than in the um, OVIPEC-1 trial, although it was almost double with respect to the non-IPEC group. Um, great remorbidity, again, the double with respect to non-IPEC, but there was no death, as you can see here. Um, and if we look at the morbidity, it was mainly regarding blood disorders. Severe kidney failure, they made, um, overall this was the difference, but they made an amendment in order to include the use of thiosulfate. And you see that when thiosulfate was included, there was no more any difference in terms of kidney failure between IPEC and no IPEC. Maintenance with BEV, a very small rate. Maintenance with PARP, around 20%, no big differences between the two population. And uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, BRCA mute was around 30% as expected. So this is the primary endpoint, overall survival. Look at this. Again, same at the ratio as the OVIPEC-1, same difference in terms of months, 
of median overall survival without and with ITEC. So um, this is uh, 11 months. Okay. If we look at progression free survival as a ratio consistent with the data of the AVIPEC 1 trial, difference two months only. Exactly the same results that we have seen for each study using uh, natural chemotherapy and then surgery with IPEC. Uh, time to subsequent treatment, uh, again, the same as a ratio, and actually no big difference uh, in terms of median time to subsequent treatment. So the conclusion of the CHIPO trial is that hiding, adding HIPEC to cytoreductive surgery after six cycles of second-line chemotherapy for patients with first late relapse of ovarian cancer significantly improves overall survival. This is the largest the prospectively randomized trial showing an overall survival benefit from IPEC in relapsed ovarian cancer. Progression-free survival and time to subsequent treatment are also significantly improved. With IPEC, this treatment must be performed in specialized centers. I want to show you just one point that I didn't... Um, uh, discuss with you, which was the median overall survival reported in this study. And if we look at the known hyper group, which means surgery only in patients with platinum sensitive relapse, this is 45.7 months, which is exactly the same value that the desktop three trial has reported for the secondary cytoreductive surgery. So it seems really very much consistent with the results um, obtained in another randomized trial. So it means that the addition of IPEC is able to improve the results obtained with the desktop three trial. Now, we might also argue that patients have received some kind of additional therapies over their time after the, the relapse. And this might have influenced the um, final results of overall survival. But if we look at the rate of PARP inhibitors that patients have received here, it's about 20%, which is much higher than the rate in the desktop three trial. But we really don't know whether this gives really a benefit in terms of post recurrent survival. As we know from the other trials, especially not only in BRCA mutated patients, that it may even be um, detrimental in terms of um, overall survival or post recurrent survival. So, having said that, um, where we are now, <laughs> um, almost completed. Um, the last trial that we have, a randomized trial, is the MSK trial. This was a phase two randomized trial in patients with recurrent ovarian cancer, platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer, who did not receive any, um, let's say, adjuvant chemotherapy at time of recurrence. Um, this was a special study because they selected patients who were not really very much chemosensitive. Um, indeed, they, they put like cutoff of uh, platinum-free interval, which was uh, less than 30 months. So if they had a platinum-free interval longer than 30 months, this patient could not be included in the trial. The second point, and none of these patients could receive PARP inhibitors, um, they received only five cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy because one of the cycle, the sixth cycle, was considered the one uh, with IPEC. You see here, this is the population. And you see here some characteristics. Carboplatinum, in this case, not cisplatinum, 800 milligrams per meter square for 90 minutes. This is the temperature. The residual tumor here is up to five millimeters and randomization was performed at the end of surgery. There was no difference in terms of clinical characteristics. And you see here the curves. So this is a negative study, negative study for progression free and overall survival, no difference um, for IPEC versus non-IPEC. 
if we look at patient's characteristics, uh, there were no difference, as I told you, except for one, except for, of course, operative time, but this is expected. And the other difference is in terms of bowel resection. And actually, if you look at the standard arm, they had 65% of bowel resection with respect to the IPEC arm. So it seems that patients um, who were somehow considered um, randomized to IPEC, they had a, a less aggressive surgery with respect to the non-IPEC treatment. And this might have justified the, um, uh, the results in terms of survival. Again, no difference in terms of complications. So the conclusion is that HIPEC with carboplatin was well tolerated, but did not result in superior clinical outcomes. Now, last words on the ongoing studies, just like a list of studies, we have the OVIPEC 2 trial, exactly the same as the OVIPEC 1 for the primary, the bulk in surgery. So here patients have not received chemotherapy and they are randomized at the end of surgery. Um, if they receive complete or near complete cytoreductive surgery. Um, I think around 600 patients have been considered for this study and around 200 have been enrolled. This is a GOG study uh, which should perf be performed in the United States. I think it's interesting because um, these patients received nerve chemotherapy and then they undergo um, optimal cytoreductive surgery and then they are randomized with the same scheme schedule as the OVIPEC-1. But the nice thing is that these patients then receive PARP inhibitor until progression. But this study has never been initiated right now. And the reason is that they have a shortage of this platinum um, uh, drug in the United States. So this study has not been initiated yet. We have the CHIPI trial, which is like uh, the Korean trial. So they include all patients, both primary and interval, and they are randomized after surgery with IPEC and no IPEC. We have our study, which was closed on May 2018. So we are very much looking for the results. And you know why we have not published these results? Yes, simply because we have not events. So we don't know how to <clears throat> solve the problem. We have now put an um, uh, organized like a, um, an independent committee to evaluate the trial. If we can, you know, uh, publish at least the results that we have. And we are waiting until December in order to, um, to see whether we are able to collect some more events. That's the reason why we have never published these results yet. Um, I, I like to mention two, um, some data about the role of IPEC in mucinous ovarian cancer, uh, especially recurrent cancer. You see here the results in terms of overall survival and disease-free survival. You see the number of patients is not bad and median overall uh, survival and disease-free survival was not reached. And I think this is really very interesting, which is in line with this trial that now is ongoing at the MD Anderson. It's a phase two study with secondary cytoreductive surgery and IPEC with cisplatin 200 milligram per meter square. So a very high dose in patients with recurrent mucinous ovarian cancer. They experienced this approach in two patients. Uh, these patients had no adjuvant chemotherapy at all. And they had a quite um, remarkably durable response of 21 and 27 months. And this is why now they are conducting this study. Final remark, I told you how, what was the increase in terms of um, of IPEC after the publication of the OVIPEC-1 trial. So this is the reality today. So um, more and more centers all over the world are going to use IPEC and offer IPEC to their patients. Um, the meta-analysis that have been published until now have shown that there is an advantage for overall survival and progression-free survival for patients receiving IPEC uh, versus control. 
And this is a nice meta-analysis that has uh, divided the population between patients receiving uh, Nedjuvan chemotherapy within six months before surgery and NITEC or uh, uh, after six months uh, um, before receiving uh, uh, cytoreductase prior to receiving cytoreductase surgery and ITEC. You see here 15 studies, uh, 10 were case control, five randomized, uh, and they had 1,000 patients with ITEC and 800 without ITEC. And look at the results. There is an advantage if the patient had a recent exposure to chemotherapy, which means less than six months in terms of progression-free and overall survival with all these studies, very interesting. There is no advantage if they had no recent exposure to chemotherapy, which means within six months from surgery and ITAC. So in conclusion, in conclusion, I would say that um, the survival improvement has been prospectively demonstrated in two randomized trials, one interval surgery, and one secondary cytoreductive surgery, all these patients had received chemotherapy before. Um, it seems that IPEC at time of interval debulking surgery does not lead to an increased number of complications and does not affect neither patient's recovery after surgery, not time to start adjuvant treatment. I can't say the same for the cheaper trial because it has not pub been published yet. So I do not have access to the whole data. And as far as I see, we have 20% of complications higher than grade three or equal to grade three in the hyper group, in the non hyper group with respect to 40% in the hyper group. And finally, to whom IPEC can be offered to patients at interval debulking surgery and probably also at secondary cytoreductive surgery after management chemotherapy, because the improvement in terms of overall survival is really very high, very long. Um, and of course, we are waiting for comparison with uh, um, uh, molecular data um, with respect to BRCA mutational status. So this is all. I'm sorry if it was really long. I tried to do my best to summarize everything and I'm happy to respond to your questions. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I have a few questions myself. So would you now recommend HIPEC? Because I think there's a problem with HIPEC that there's no standardization. Like one paper say, says like this, uh, another uh, paper says like this. So we still don't have any standards. So would you now recommend HIPEC for all advanced cases of ovarian cancer? Not really. I um, I would say I would counsel patients, not recommend, but counsel patients that there is a possibility to receive IPEC according to uh, the recent publication. So I would recommend IPEC after three to four cycles of natural chemotherapy in patients having complete or almost complete uh, interval debulking surgery at the doses and the time and we take thiosulfate of the OVIPEC-1 trial. This is how we counsel our patients. And most of them actually come to and ask for IPEC. They come even from outside Italy to receive IPEC. And probably after the publication of the cheaper trial, I would also counsel patients at time of secondary cytoreductive surgery according to their protocol. So, I mean, the only difference is that these patients are receiving 75 milligrams instead of 100 milligrams. But yes, I would count, I would say this patient that there is this kind of possibility. Why not? I think okay. it's, um, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, it's good for the patient to know. And actually most of the patient already know, they ask for. Okay, and what is the cutoff level of accepted PCI after which you will say, okay, this patient will not benefit, I will not do HIPEC? It's not really a PCI. I think it's a matter of complete cytoreduction. We don't use PCI. We use uh, our score, laparoscopic score. The so Fagotti we, score. Yes. So we know that up to eight, 
we are able to cytoreduce patients. So we can keep sur continuous surgery until complete cytoreduction. And if it's complete, it's complete. So we will, we, when we counsel the patient, we say they always sign a consent that if we have complete or almost complete cytoreduction, then they can receive IPEC. And we send them the schedule, the scheme uh, before uh, surgery. And then we, mm, we, we send okay just if we have complete site reduction. Can you give me a summary of uh, Fagotti score, how it works? But it works, uh, it, it's mainly made by laparoscopy. It's not assessed by um, open surgery, but you can do it, of course. Uh, we assess different areas in the abdomen. So we start from the upper abdomen and we consider presence of um, diaphragmatic carcinomatosis uh, on both diaphragm. Then we consider the um, presence of uh, um, liver metastasis. Of course, we cannot uh, assess intraparenchymal metastasis, but just on the surface of the, of the liver, if they are larger than two centimeters and deeply infiltrating from external, we see if they are infiltrating uh, the parenchyma. Then we assess the upper left quadrant. So we consider presence of cancer in the spleen uh, or uh, to the stomach or um, the small, uh, the um, uh, lesser sac. And then we consider the need of bowel resection except for anterior rectal resection. So any other additional resection is considered like a positive score. And parieti parietal carcinomatosis, and the presence of a mental cake, which is which involves the um, gastrocolic ligament. So it's not really the larger omentum, but it's the gastrocolic ligament, which means that there is a lot of carcinomatosis. So each of these variables is positive as a score of two. The sum of them gives a total score. If it is if it is higher than eight, then the chances to achieve complete site reduction is very low, almost zero, at least in our experience. Okay, take a question from Dr. Uh, Walid Akmal. <clears throat> okay, hello, uh, Professor Anna. It's uh, always a pleasure for us to hear you and we are delighted with your talk. Uh, I would like to ask you a question regarding uh, your uh, experience with liver meds, which is stage four epithelial ovarian cancer. Uh, how, uh, what is the number of acceptable liver meds we would go for site reduction and high pick? Uh, after a section? There is not, I mean, uh, the, the number of acceptable uh, um, liver, resection, uh, liver resection is not related to IPEC. Uh, it's, uh, you know, um, an overall evaluation which uh, is is not necessarily related to IPEC. If um, um, it depends, uh, we may have like a typical resection, which is uh, like a small nodule in one uh, little part of one segment of the liver, then we can do two or three of this kind of segmental um, resections. But if it's more, or if it belongs to the two lobes, or if we need to perform like a partial liver resection, then we don't, we don't do it. I mean, um, in that case, we believe uh, it's too much for the patient. A few days ago, we performed up to four segmental resection. This was still, mm. uh, still feasible in a young patient. Uh, um, she had no much carcinomatosis. She had mainly a liver disease, and this was possible to do. Of course, okay. with our liver surgeons, not, we did not by ourselves. <laughs> okay, okay. Another question, please. Uh, uh, what is uh, your uh, opinion about redo high pick for uh, recurrent posterior ovarian cancer with peritoneal carcinomatosis? Patient already underwent site reduction in high pick, now presented with another peritoneal carcinomatosis. Uh, what do you, would you consider a redo site reduction in the high pick for this, this kind of patients? So, you know, we are trying to uh, to follow guidelines or at least uh, evidence from the literature. So we don't have much evidence on this, but in general, we performed like a study, which was a prospective study where we performed a subsequent re ipec in this kind of patients, as you said, and we had no additional complications. So it was like 12 cases, 
mm, that mm. we did like this and we didn't find any special utterances after the first surgery and we had no additional complications uh, after this um, second, uh, let's say, HIPEC. And my question would be why we should expect additional complications? I mean, if we do mm -hmm. second line, third line, fourth line of chemotherapy, why we should have additional complications with HIPEC, which is simply a second line chemotherapy associated with secondary yes. reductive surgery? Mm -hmm. Okay, my last question, uh, if you perform a bowel resection and anastomosis, uh, would you do the high pick before the resection or after the resection of the We, you are talking about a resection, correct? Yes, uh, I mean you do a resection and you you do the high pick after the resection or after the anastomosis. No, no, we do after the anastomosis. And right now, I was talking with our colleagues in France, and we mm. were they were explaining to me that after the results of the trial on colon cancer, actually they do the closet technique. So they do bowel resection, anastomosis, then they perform IPEC, and they mm -hmm. do not reopen and reassess the anastomosis unless they have some doubts. So this is able to reduce the surgical timing, which is important in terms of operating uh, mm, uh, costs, you know, so we yes. can care about um, from around 40 minutes with this kind of procedure of reopening, rechecking, and then reclosing the abdomen. And so this is yes. something that we are now implementing in our uh, um, uh, clinical activity. And I must say that we haven't had any kind of problem in terms of anastomosis, even if we don't check again. So we, if we are sure if the anastomosis is okay, it's not the mm. high back that is going to give a higher risk of bowel fistulas postoperatively. Okay. And what about uh, total uh, peritonectomy versus selective peritonectomy uh, for peritoneal disease? interesting question and you know there is a big debate on this actually i can tell you that um, in our institution we do not perform total peritonectomy we don't believe that there is a reason i mean if there if we must perform total peritonectomy then we have to resect the entire bowel or any any <laughs> organ which is in the abdomen which is covered by um, visceral peritoneum so although we believe that there is still residual microscopic disease there we don't believe it makes uh, um, a difference in terms of survival if we resect or not okay Okay, another question, please. Uh, what, uh, what is the acceptable urine output for the patient during the high peak itself during the 90 minutes? Um, you mean urine output? Yes, urine output, yes. I don't know. You know, this is something <laughs> that the anesthesiologists are checking. So I don't okay, know. I trust okay. my anesthesiologist. I'm sorry. I can let you know. I, I will ask them. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot, dear professor. I mean, very no, nice. It's my pleasure. Thanks a lot. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for your questions. I have a question with, which is a bit unusual because I this is a research idea I've been working on and I presented it in ESSO as a surgical trial proposal. Uh, I'll tell you a brief hint yeah. and see what you think about it. So I think we have like... We're using now HIPEC in abdominal malignancies, in gastric cancer, colorectal ovarian cancer, and we even use the HIPEC in the thorax when we do high talk for mesothelioma and so on. And we even use hyperthermic chemotherapy in melanoma, and we inject it in the limbs in hyperthermic isolated limb perfusion. My idea is to use hyperthermic chemotherapy for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's the most common malignancy. And yet, we still didn't use the trihyperthermic chemotherapy treating this malignancy. We can use it after a mastectomy, for example. Mm, interesting. In the abdomen, you mean, anyway? No, in the after a mastectomy, in the breast cavity. Ooh, I've never heard something like that. Yeah, it's my idea. It's still new. <laughs> Okay, okay. So let me know if you are doing this. Uh, maybe may, I may still have patients, you know, that could be interested in being treated like this. Yeah, uh, I can send you some, uh, maybe a poster. I will send you the poster I did and mm. read it and think about it and let me know if there's maybe a way to collaborate or something. 
Okay, okay. I can ask also to my surgeons who are doing uh, um, breast cancer. So okay. maybe they can do it. Okay, I will send you the email today. Good. Okay, do we have any more questions? Please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, I think that was it. Okay. But it was a pleasure having you. And uh, maybe if you have the time in the future, maybe after a few months, maybe you can arrange another talk. Okay, thank you so much. It was really nice to talk with, uh, uh, with all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Anna, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Very soon. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.